Welcome to Virology Live. This is session number 13. Today we're going to talk about intrinsic and innate defenses. It's the first of two sessions, both this week, about immune defenses. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. The trouble with facts is that there are so many of them. Here's an overview of host defenses. I'm sorry I don't have my um, little picture there because I could always do that. No, my, uh, there's a little cropping issue, so you're not going to see me during the lectures today. I'll fix it in time for Wednesday. We have host defenses as this can be visualized as a series of barriers or walls as they are shown here. We have many viruses entering a host and it will, they will initially encounter anatomical and chemical barriers. Of course, these are always present and they include mucus on respiratory and gastrointestinal and other epithelial cells, saliva, stomach acid, tears, skin, of course, a major barrier, the outer layer being dead scabs, defensins, proteins, antiviral and antimicrobial proteins produced by the skin microbiome. And so that is a quite an effective barrier, but of course can be breached and uh, some viruses will get past it. And then they encounter intrinsic defenses right here and we're gonna be talking about those today. Uh, those are immediately active and they include interferons, autophagy, apoptosis, microRNAs, and CRISPR. Talk about those today. Uh, then if some viruses get past them, and of course some do, that's why we still get infections, of course, the viruses will encounter innate immunity, which takes a little bit of time to be induced, but um, not very long, minutes to hours. And innate immunity includes natural killer cells complement antigen-presenting cells, neutrophils, and cytokines, including interferons. So today we'll talk about intrinsic and innate immunity. And then, should some viruses overcome those, and they, of course some do, uh, then they uh, will... It, encounter acquired immunity, which takes longer, um, perhaps days if it's a memory response, uh, perhaps multiple days if it's an initial response. We'll talk about that on Wednesday. The adaptive response, of, of course, comprises mainly T cells and B cells. So let us start with uh, an overview again of host defenses. Again, intrinsic, a little more detail. Intrinsic defenses are always present in the uninfected cell. Always present. They don't have to be induced. Uh, here, they're ready to go. And they comprise autophagy, apoptosis, RNA silencing, and antiviral proteins. The innate indu immune system is induced by infection. You could imagine it at, as warming up is required. Uh, and the adaptive immune system, which we will talk about on Wednesday, is tailored to the pathogen. That's why it takes longer, because antibodies in T cells are virus specific. We'll, we'll talk about those on Wednesday. Let's start with intrinsic defenses. Uh, we really have only mentioned physical and chemical defenses, uh, but uh, that's all for them. Today, intrinsic, the first is RNA interference. What is RNA interference? So let's say a virus is infecting a cell and in the process of reproducing or replicating its genome, double-stranded RNA is produced. Of course, many RNA viruses make double-stranded RNA as part of their reproduction cycles, both DNA and RNA viruses, in fact. 
We talked about how adenoviruses produce double-stranded RNA as a result of transcription of both strands of DNA at the same place. You make a plus and a minus RNA, and they will hybridize. Double-stranded RNA is recognized by a system of proteins in the cell. One of them is shown here. It's called DICER, which is a great name because, in fact, what it does, what DICER does is to chop up the RNA the double-stranded RNA, into 21 nucleotide long pieces. It dices it up. And then only one strand is forms a, a part of a risk complex, RNA-induced silencing complex. That's what risk stands for. Um, we had a twiv years ago called Risky Business with Raul Andino that was all about his work on risk in insects. Another protein associated with this complex is called argonaut or ego. And now this is called an siRNA, a small interfering RNA. And it is, of course, complementary to at least one strand of the viral uh, RNA. And so it will hybridize it. Yeah, that that complementary short interfering RNA will hybridize to the viral RNA because it was produced from the viral RNA, right? And that brings the risk complex to the RNA and it chops it up, chops up the viral RNA so it basically inactivates it. So this is a, clearly an antiviral system. Now, it is essential for antiviral defense in plant cells and in invertebrate cells. Mammals certainly have the machinery. Mammals certainly make regulatory, short regulatory RNAs called microRNAs, which are similar to these uh, siRNAs that, they're, that are used to regulate gene expression in cells. Many viral genomes encode microRNAs. However, whether RNA interference is antiviral in mammals is a matter of some controversy. And why is that? Well, some people have evidence that it's not needed, others that it is. Perhaps it's needed only in germ cells. The reason that we think so is because mammals have protein-based immune defenses, right? We have antibodies and T cells and so forth, so it's not clear that uh, RNA-based defenses are needed. It, this is an ancient defense, RNA interference, and it may have been present in early uh, eukaryotes and perhaps even mammals, but maybe it was lost and replaced by uh, protein-based defenses. Anyway, viruses uh, cannot get around this defense unless they encode countermeasures in their genomes. Uh, and so the viruses of plants and mammals, uh, these... Um, encode proteins that antagonize different parts of this defense that, for example, bind RNA or bind some of these proteins and inhibit their activity. As you'll see at every step of today's and Wednesday's discussion, um, uh, everything has a countermeasure. Otherwise, viruses would not exist. These defenses are quite strong. Uh, and so if... Uh, Virus genomes didn't encode countermeasures, they wouldn't be in existence. Another intrinsic defense comprises a set of proteins called ApoBex. ApoBex stands for apolipoprotein B mRNA editing catalytic polypeptide. I know we have a lot of abbreviations in science, <laughs> but you don't want to you don't want to keep saying this the name of this. Uh, protein over and over, ApoBec. And uh, there are multiple genes encoding uh, ApoBecs in the, uh, well, in, in animal genomes, in mammal genomes. Those are actually shown here. Each of these little arrows is a gene encoding an ApoBec. And you can see humans and chimps have a lot of them. Uh, there are fewer in, in rodents and pigs and so forth, but lots in bats. Uh, these are intrinsic antiviral proteins. And so this repetition of these genes implies that the pressure of virus infections on these organisms uh, 
has led to the amplification of the genes over time or the selection for it, uh, amplification. Uh, it, you know, if, if a gene becomes amplified and it's useful, it remains. Anyway, what's an apobec? An apobec is a protein produced in cells uh, which is a cytidine deaminase and which potently inhibits HIV, HIV-1 infectivity. So here on the bottom of the picture, we see uh, apobec. In this case, it's 3G or 3F. There are many isoforms of, of these proteins. Uh, being incorporated into the HIV particle as the particle buds from the cell. And now we have a mature HIV-1 particle with the membrane, the spikes, the nucleocapsid containing the genome and so forth. And in it is now apobec, protein. When that virus infects a new cell, of course, the core of the particle is released into the cytoplasm. And remember, the first step is reverse transcription to make a... Uh, a, cop a DNA copy of that RNA, the viral RNA shown here in green. The DNA is in blue, so that's our, our first strand of DNA there. Um, but uh, what this does is, uh, here's the, the viral RNA, and now we have minus strand DNA synthesis. That's the first strand that's made. And this enzyme, apobec, will change uh, C's to U's. Cytidine deaminase, it removes an amino group on the cytidine, and that changes the C into a U. That's all you need to do to make a C into a U, is to take off an amino group. Uh, and so that's the activity of this enzyme. It's a cytidine deaminase that changes C to U in the DNA. And now, when the second strand of DNA is made by reverse transcriptase, it's an A, whereas, remember, it was originally a C. It should have been a G. So we have G to A changes. So this happens throughout the genome wherever there is a C. And you can imagine the effect is to inactivate the genome. It loses infectivity because these are essentially mutations introduced into the DNA. These are not supposed to be there. and They're going to change the protein sequence. They're going to introduce stop codons. And so this is how this protein works. It is incorporated into the particle, and it mutates the virus uh, out of infectivity. So now, you may ask, well, how is it that we still have an HIV-AIDS pandemic? Well, because the HIV genome encodes an antagonist in the form of a viral protein called VIF, virion infectivity factor. And only if you remove VIF from the HIV genome can apobec be incorporated into the particles and lead to inhibition in the next cell. And normally, VIF is present in infected cells. It is produced. And VIF, is shown here in, in blue, binds apobec and directs it to a protein complex, which is shown here, all these obscure names, CUL5, NET8, et cetera, et cetera. What that does is to add ubiquitin moieties onto the apobec. So VIF targets apobec proteins to the ubiquitination machinery, uh, and that adds U's to apobec. And what does that do? When you add ubiquitin to a protein, one of the outcomes can be that the protein is sent to the proteasome which you can view as the garbage disposal machinery of the cell. It takes proteins and runs it through, and out come peptides. Now, we'll see that this is actually a useful machine uh, in terms of immune responses. We'll see that next time. But if you want to degrade proteins, you send it to the proteasome, and that is the proteins have to have a, a, an address on them to be sent there, and that's ubiquitin. So apobec is degraded, so it's never incorporated into the virus particle, and normal reverse transcription occurs. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> that's apobec, an intrinsic defense. It's always present. doesn't have to be induced. Another intrinsic defense is epigenetic silencing. What is this? 
We've talked very briefly before about how DNA in our nucleus uh, is compacted or can be compacted. It's wrapped around nucleosomes, as shown here. These nucleosomes are comprised of histones. And uh, when the, the, this chromatin, as it's called, when it's compacted, it's hard to transcribe it. So we, we say that the chromatin is silenced. It's very hard for RNA polymerase II to get in there and transcribe genes and make mRNAs, so the, gene, the DNA is silenced. So how do you compact chromatin, and how do you reverse it so that you can get transcription? Because obviously we need to make mRNAs, right? Well, you can do a number of chemical modifications of the histones. One of them is acetylation. That's shown by this red flag here. Acetylation is the addition of acetyl group to the histone proteins at the ends here, the histone tails. And that causes the chromatin to open up. That simple modification opens up the chromatin. You can now, RNA polymerase II can now access it and can carry out mRNA synthesis. Now, when, when DNA, when foreign DNA enters the nucleus, or any DNA enters the nucleus, it is silenced by a machinery that adds uh, acetyl groups to histone tails because it shouldn't be there. So when viral DNAs get in the nucleus, they're going to be silenced uh, unless they encode countermeasures. And so many viral genomes encode countermeasures to pre prevent silencing. Uh, for example, the human cytomegalovirus protein 71 causes a degradation of a cell protein called DAX, which is needed for deacetylation. So if you have Foreign, any DNA coming in the nucleus, what happens is it's wrapped around histones, it's chromatinized, and then acetylated. Uh, sorry, it's, it's deacetylated. And so if it happens to have acetyl groups on it, they're taken off to silence it. So deacetylation is silencing, and this virus genome encodes a protein to prevent deacetylation. Now, other viruses, Epstein-Barr virus or herpes virus, adenovirus, encode proteins that uh, affect uh, PML body protein localization. So PML bodies arise in the nucleus typically during DNA virus infection. So here is a stain of infected cells. We've, we've stained the, the nucleus with DAPI. That's blue. And then PML bodies are... Um, shown by an ant staining with an antibody that's uh, against one of the protein components. And you can see there are these green punctate structures in the nucleus. And they're induced by virus infection. And what they are, they're sites where uh, viral DNA is silenced. So the viral DNA is shunted to these locations and they're silenced. And so the um, uh, virus, these viruses encode proteins that antagonize the shunting of the viral DNA to the PML body. Finally, the last example here, which I think is, is just brilliant in its simplicity. When Remember, retroviral DNA enters the nucleus after being produced in the cytoplasm from viral RNA. It enters the nucleus, and it's immediately chromatinized and silenced. It's compacted. But integrated DNA is not silenced. It's part of the chromosome. So the cell says, hey, you're one of us. Doesn't even recognize it because it's just there. And it's, if it's integrated, that's a sign that it's self. And so it is not silenced. So integration per se is an antagonist of silencing. Now, isn't that incredible? Now, the PML bodies, by the way, are these structures in the nucleus that form when DNA viruses infect the cell, um, and they are sites of silencing. Those are where the viral DNAs are chromatinized in science. PML stands for promyelocytic leukemia. It has nothing to do with the activity we're talking about. That's how they were discovered, promyelocytic leukemia. Uh, but there's spherical structures. The organizing component is the PML protein. Uh, and um, they are where the viral DNAs are compacted and silenced. And so viruses need to get out of there. And another intrinsic defense is apoptosis, um, programmed cell death. When a, vi when a cell undergoes some kind of stress, it could be virus infection, 
It could be lack of nutrients. It could be temperatures and so forth. Uh, a program begins uh, which uh, starts to kill the cell. Apoptosis is programmed as a form of programmed cell death. The cell dies, and the, the idea, the strategy is, as far as we can tell, and this has been borne out by experimental data, the strategy is that you kill the infected cell. That prevents the spread of infection. And so there's a, there are whole signaling pathways involved in apoptosis, which we'll discuss in a moment. Uh, but one of the features of apoptosis is that pieces of the cell bleb off to form what are called apoptotic bodies. This is, these are actually then recycled. They're taken up by other cells. But in particular, macrophages, uh, the sen one of the sentinel cells that patrol our bodies to see if there's anything foreign happening, uh, they take up apoptotic bodies and sample them to see if there's any foreign antigen in them. How that happens, we'll talk about in a bit. So the, the process of apoptosis is essential not only to prevent infection or to limit it, but also to inform the immune system whether there is something foreign uh, in it. So apoptosis is monitored by sentinel cells. Apoptosis can be induced in multiple ways. Um, first of all, there's what's called an extrinsic pathway of inducing apoptosis. So there are receptors on the cell surface. They're shown here. They're called FAS, trail R, TNFR, tumor necrosis factor receptor. And these have ligands which, when they bind to the receptor, will induce apoptosis. So, for example, binding of FAS ligand to FAS turns on apoptosis. Binding of trail to its receptor, binding of TNF to its receptor. TNF is a protein uh, produced uh, during immune responses which whose function is to kill infected cells, also kills tumor cells. When these ligands bind, they induce signaling pathways uh, which involve the cleavage of what are called caspases. Here you can see procaspase 8 is cleaved proteolytically. It becomes an active caspase 8 uh, and then that induces more signaling uh, eventually, uh, it ends up inducing apoptosis by activating another caspase. There's a series of cleavages, and, and these caspase proteins are essential in turning on apoptosis. That's the extrinsic pathway. The intrinsic occurs when there's mitochondrial damage, which can also happen during stress. The mitochondria release uh, cytochrome C, and that is sensed by one of the caspases, and that initiates apoptosis as well. So when, when the mitochondria are damaged, this is really bad for a number of reasons, and the cell uh, wants to kill itself. So um, this induces the uh, intrinsic uh, apoptosis pathway. But it, the, the key here for, for this slide is that viruses can stimulate apoptosis. That's the green lines, so they can stimulate uh, external receptors. These viruses all encode proteins that stimulate apoptosis. Some viruses stimulate them down here at the caspase 810 step. And some viruses inhibit apoptosis. You can see they're inhibitors of TNF receptor. They're inhibitors of the uh, activation of procaspase 8. They're inhibit inhibitors of this step here. So viruses can either stimulate or inhibit apoptosis. So why would a virus stimulate apoptosis? Well, not why, but what would be the function, perhaps, to facilitate release of virus particles uh, from the cell? And in inhibition of apoptosis, well, if a virus has a particularly long reproduction cycle, then it might be beneficial to inhibit apoptosis so uh, to allow uh, assembly of new virus particles to begin. All right, so that's another intrinsic defense. Uh, CRISPR is an ancient defense. It arose as a defense against infection. It didn't arise as a gene editing set of proteins. That was only uh, devised by humans. So this has been repurposed by us to do gene editing. But its original incarnation many millions of years ago is an ancient defense. It's an ancient intrinsic defense. Defense And CRISPR, of course, stands for clustered, regularly interspaced, short, palindromic, repeats. That's another word we need a 
abbreviation for. You don't want to say that over and over again. CRISPR. So what is CRISPR? Well, first of all, it's in 90% of archaea and 50% of bacteria, three domains of life, bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes, right? Um, bacteria and archaea are the most ancient. And they both have CRISPR defenses. So, for example, in a bacterium, when a bacteriophage infects, uh, its DNA is cut up by the enzymes of the CRISPR system. Pieces of the, the phage DNA are integrated into the host. And then they are transcribed into CRISPR RNAs. Should this phage infect that cell again, the CRISPR RNA will recognize the DNA and together with a, a nuclease will degrade it. Now, of course, this assumes that this cell survived phage infection and not all uh, hosts will survive infection, but some do. And those that survive will have a memory of the infection in, in the form of pieces of DNA integrated into the bacterial or archaeal DNA, uh, which remain there forever. And it's, there are many of them. That's why they are clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic retreats. And these were first discovered in the 80s. People sequencing bacterial genomes, and they said, hey, what are all these repeated sequences? And from there, people figured out what they were. And I have to say that um, you can now figure out what has infected a bacterium by sequencing these uh, palindromic repeats. You can do homology searches and say, oh, look, this bacteriophage infected this particular virus. It's a way of uh, matching viruses with hosts. So that is an ancient defense. We don't have this, although siRNA is sort of a similar thing, except that we don't store the, um, uh, the, the memory of that in our genome. All right, it's time for a quiz. So in order to uh, take a quiz, you need to go to uh, Socrative.com. Well, there's the, the link on the slide, right? You bring it back, Socrative.com slash login student. The room number is virus. And once you start, don't close the window. It's very important that you don't close the window. Intrinsic defenses are always present. Which of the following are included? Antibodies, T cells, epigenetic silencing, skin or mucus. And while you are working on that, let's uh, bring up some questions here. The first thing I have to say is that um, this week's Q&A with A and V, if those, for those of you that attend, is usually on Wednesday evenings at 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern. It's going to be Thursday night this week. I have a scheduling conflict. So 8 p.m. Thursday Eastern. The good news is Amy will join me here uh, at the incubator. Okay. I'm moving through the weather reports here. <laughs> what have we what have we inspired? Isn't that great? I know there were questions here. Uh, if you want a book, uh, yeah, you can get the third edition. That'll be fine. You can get used versions pretty quickly, uh, pretty cheaply. Yep. I assume you plan TWIM, TWIM 50 and TWIV 829. So you mean immune 50 because that's all about innate censoring by red blood cells. Pretty cool. Yeah, I didn't plan it. Yeah. If HCMV degrades DAX, does that mean that it also causes cell genes to be inadvertently turned on? Um, well, that's a good question, and you know, I don't know the answer whether it's specific for uh, viral DNA or not, or whether uh, it's uh, localized in a way to not impact cell genes. But yes, that that would be an outcome, right? Um, some cell genes would be turned on, but maybe they're required for virus reproduction. So I actually don't know 
what's known about that, but it's a really interesting question. Uh, VIF originates from HIV, April back from the cell. How was the first VIF produced? Oh, well, this is the, the, the you know, the evolutionary question. Um, remember, even um, cells undergo, well, this is a virus. How is the first VIF produced? So viruses mutate extensively. And so you can imagine that there's a protein in the genome with some other function, and it's changing slightly. Just random amino acid changes, which you know, don't in inactivate its, its function. And then one day, a change happens to let it bind uh, ApoBec, and that is beneficial. So this happens slowly over many years, and eventually you have a VIF. So it derives from another protein, for sure. But it's so long ago that we don't have evidence for it, right? When we're vaccinated, what defenses are activated? Does it depend on the vaccine? Well, yes, it would. But I think we, we'll, let's get through this lecture on Wednesdays because in the process, you'll figure out the answer. And then when we look at vaccines, we'll, we'll explore it even more. But it does depend on the particular vaccine. Where does the CRISPR nuclease come from? It's in, this, it's in the genome of the bacterium or the archaea. Uh, one of the nucleases is Cas9, CRISPR-associated nuclease number nine, but there are many, many other. This is the one that's been best characterized. It's the first to be used in gene editing, but there are others, many others, with different properties from different organisms. Yeah. Okay, so let me mark that as the last one answered, and let's go back to uh, our quiz. So... 46 of 50, not bad. Uh, which of the following are always included? Intrinsic defense. Of course, the antibodies and T cells are not intrinsic defenses. Uh, skin is a physical defense, right? Of course, it's always present, <laughs> I would hope, but I categorized it as a physical defense in that first slide, and so is mucus. So intrinsic, there's a certain class of, of uh, proteins in the cell that are always present, and I distinguish them from physical and chemical defenses. All right, let's talk about the innate immune system next. Talked about, here we go, anatomical and chemical barriers, that's skin and mucus, intrinsic set of proteins that we've talked about, apoptotic, CRISPR, uh, apobex, silencing proteins. Now we have innate immunity. Uh, this needs to be induced. It's activated within minutes to hours after infection. It comprises cytokines, sentinel cells, and complement. All right, and what are sentinel cells? We've already briefly mentioned these dendritic cells, matros, macrophages, and NK or natural killer cells. Natural killer cells. And again, it takes minutes to hours to induce the innate response, but even as important as it being able to inter, uh, interfere with the virus infection, it can inform the adaptive response when infection reaches a dangerous threshold because the, the innate and the adaptive responses are communicating. The way they do that, we'll see today and Wednesday exactly how they do that. So let's do a little history here. First of all, how does the innate immune system recognize a microbe or a virus and not itself? This was a conundrum for many years. It had been postulated uh, by a number of immunologists that there was some system for distinguishing self from non-self, but what exactly it was uh, wasn't clear. Uh, however, that changed in 1980. Uh, when two scientists, Christian nusslein volhard and Eric Wieschaus, they were studying fruit flies. They were interested in how fruit flies developed. And fruit flies are great models for studying all, all aspects of uh, biology, particularly developmental biology. And in the 1980s, it was an early time, they wanted to know what genes are involved in establishing the dorsal ventral axis in the fly. 
the developmental genes. And so the, what they did was they would mutate flies, which you can do quite readily, and then look at phenotypes. So one day, the story has it uh, that uh, Christian called over Eric. She was looking at the microscope at some mutated flies, and one of them was really weird. So she said, Das war ja toll. I know, I've, I mangled the German. I'm sorry. German is not my forte. Italian is. Okay? And it means far out. Right? Wow, look at that. This is amazing. And so it turned out that they, the gene that they had mutated, they called the toll gene as a consequence of her saying this, which is cool. Uh, they got a Nobel Prize for this in 1995 because not only was that gene important in flies, it turned out to have a huge role in immunity uh, in mammals. So in 1996, the, it was found, this gene, the toll gene was found to have not only a role in flies in development, but also in immunity of the fly to microbes. And in 97, toll-like receptors were identified in mammals. So... Let me emphasize again, this is called serendipity, right? If you don't let people follow their curiosity, not just any people, but scientists, you're never going to have accidental findings like this. You can't direct every research to a problem like diabetes or cancer or neuro, neurological disease. You can do some of that, but you have to let people follow their curiosity and I'm telling you, folks, right now, the, the way the budget for research is in the U.S., it's not happening as much as it should be. Okay, so that's where toll-like receptors came up. They're called toll-like because the original toll gene was in the fruit fly, and these are now toll-like receptors, or TLRs. And now we understand these are pattern recognition receptors, or PRRs. They're a number of others besides TLRs, and they're all shown on this slide. So here we have toll-like receptors. These are typically transmembrane proteins. They can be located at the plasma membrane. They could be located within endosomes. And we heard on immune 50 that TLR9 is on the surface of red blood cells. Oh my gosh, where it binds DNA. This is just blew me away, I had no idea. But in, in nucleated cells, uh, the toll-like receptors are present in two locations, and they can sense proteins, nucleic acids, sugars, and as foreign. They can sense them as foreign and not self, and that activates the innate immune response. But in addition to toll-like receptors, there are other kinds of pattern recognition receptors in the cell. For example, there are C-type lectin receptors, or CLRs, to follow on the TLR Nomenclature. These are also transmembrane proteins. They're at the plasma membrane. They recognize sugars from fungi and some bacteria. We have nucleotide binding oligomerization domain like receptors or NLRs. These are cytoplasmic sensors that recognize bacterial, viral, parasitic, fungal, PAMPs. What's a PAMP? A pathogen associated molecular pattern. That's a specific word for saying it's not self. It's something foreign, typically a, path, a pathogen. And if you've heard the word inflammasome, those are formed when these NLRs get activated, when they sense something. And finally, we have rig eye like receptor <laughs> receptors. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, RLR. So rig eye receptors, the original protein that formed the basis of this family. Um, and so um, RLR-like receptors are cytoplasmic receptors that can sense uh, viral RNA and trigger the production of uh, cytokines. So let's explore some of these uh, in some detail. Uh, so here we have on the left, this is how PAMPs are recognized by toll-like receptors. So TLR2, TLR4 are plasma membrane TLRs. They can recognize proteins of viruses uh, for example, CMV, measles virus, RS virus, MMTV, these recognize them. And they, when they do recognize or bind to a viral protein, that initiates a signaling cascade. 
uh, which goes through a, s a set of proteins that are shown here. The, the result is the induction of mRNA synthesis or transcription in the nucleus and the production of cytokine mRNAs and eventually proteins as those mRNAs go out into the cytoplasm. And they include type 1 interferons and other interferons that we'll talk about in a moment and other cytokines. Uh, then there are a set of toll-like receptors in the endosome that recognize various kinds of RNA or DNA, so double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA, and CPG. CPG is the, are the, the bases C and G. Uh, they are two of the bases in DNA, but they're particularly a pathogen signal. Our CG in our genome is rather low, so if, if, a, if a DNA is sensed with a lot of CG, it's likely to be a pathogen. And that's the TLR9 that's on the surface of red blood cells. But in an endosome, you can imagine that there's DNA present. That's where many viruses enter the cell. And again, when these ligands bind the TLRs, that initiates a signaling pathway in the form of a phosphorylation cascade. In the case of, say, TLR3, the result is a protein called IRF3 is phosphorylated. It becomes a dimer, goes in the nucleus, and it acts as a transcription factor to turn on, to help turn on a transcription of uh, interferon genes. The others, when they recognize their ligands, uh, also initiate a signaling cascade. In the case, in one case, NF kappa B is uh, activated so that it goes in the nucleus and turns on transcription, and IRF7 is another transcription factor. So these are all transcription factors that essentially reside in the cytoplasm until there is sensing of foreign RNA or protein, and then they're modified and they go in the nucleus and they turn on cytokine synthesis. It's really a remarkable uh, set of reactions. Uh, on the right is some information about cytosolic sensing. So We've had plasma membrane and endosome sensing. Here, these are actually in the cytosol. These are rig I like receptors, which comprise rig I and a, another protein, MDA5. These are two proteins that are in the cytosol, and they will recognize various kinds of DNA, of uh, RNA that is not cellular. So, for example, long double stranded RNA, the cell doesn't make that. So, if it's in the cell, it's probably viral, so that binds MDA5. Rig I can bind, uh, say, single-stranded RNA with three phosphates, which is not found in the cytoplasm. Short double-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA with phosphates. All of these configurations are not found in the uninfected cell. So you may ask, well, RNA is RNA, right? Yeah, but in these configurations, it can be recognized as viral. Anyway, when these proteins bind their cognate nucleic acid that initiates a signaling pathway. Uh, one of them goes through a protein that's actually in the mitochondrial membrane called MAVs, and that then initiates further signaling. I want to just get to the end here, which is that either IRF3 or IRF7 or NF-kappa B are activated. They go in the nucleus and they turn on the transcription of interferon genes. And what the interferon genes do, we'll find out in a moment. But that's the output. You recognize something foreign. The output is transcription of interferon genes and other cytokines. Very cool. DNA is also sensed. Uh, there are multiple DNA sensing pathways. The one we talked about on immune 50 is amazing. It's red blood cells, surface of red blood cells. Um, this is a pathway for sensing DNA in the cytoplasm. Uh, DNA shouldn't be there. DNA in the cell should be in the nucleus. So if cells, if DNA is in the cytoplasm of the cell, it's probably resulting from a virus infection of some kind. There's a protein in the cell called C-GAS. C stands for cyclic GA synthase, GMP AMP synthase, because when this uh, protein binds DNA, it becomes activated, and it takes a molecule of ATP and a molecule of GTP and makes a cyclic GAMP molecule. It's shown right there, and on the right is the actual chemical structure. There's a GMP moiety. There's the base and the ribose. There's an AMP, the base and the ribose, and they are joined via their oxygens with a phosphate in between in this cyclic structure. So that's cyclic GAMP, cyclic GAMP or C-GAMP, then binds an ER protein called STING, 
which stands for stimulator of interferon genes. You can make a lot of cool jokes about this sting policing the cell. Let's see who picks that up. <laughs> um, but the, the name stands for stimulator of interferon genes. Uh, but maybe the person who made up the name was a police fan. Who knows? Uh, then the binding of CGAMP to sting causes sting to move through the Golgi where it can then uh, bind a kinase called TBK and that initiates a number of signaling cascades. IRF3 gets phosphorylated, it goes in the nucleus. NF-kappa B gets uh, activated, it goes in the nucleus. And they bind to the promoters of genes and, and the result is... Uh, interferon synthesis. So the first person to get that was Vanity Nutrition. Welcome again, and thanks for moderating. She got it, and so did others. <laughs> Someone said on a YouTube comment on Sunday that my sense of humor was uh, rusty. I don't think that's true. Uh, by the way, my colleague Dixon de Pommier, he has a book called The Vertical Farm. Um, Sting actually has a comment on the first uh, edition, on the back cover, because he likes that sort of indoor farming thing. So the result of sensing DNA in the cytoplasm is the production of cytokines, just like sensing RNA or protein. There are also DNA sensors in the nucleus, as you might imagine, because that's where a lot of viral DNAs actually end up. There are plenty of viral modulators of sensing. <laughs> Yeah, Sting is telling the DNA, don't stand too close to me. Oh, that's brilliant. I got to highlight that. Look. I love it. Very good. <laughs> Plenty of good science jokes are possible. Uh, this is a really effective sensing system. So if viral genomes did not encode countermeasures, there would be no viruses around. So look at all the countermeasures here in red. We've talked about RNA sensing mechanisms, right? MDA5 and Rig I. So there are proteins in the red bar line mean inhibit, right? Uh, a, there's a Rig I needs to be ubiquitinated to be active, and there are viral proteins that inhibit ubiquitination. There are viral proteins that inhibit the interaction of Rig I with MAVs, which is needed for the signaling. There are viral proteins that actually cleave man, MAVs proteolytically to inhibit signaling, so that all blocks the production of cytokines. There are proteins that inhibit other kinases in the DNA sensing pathway. There are proteins that inhibit other parts of the, these are caspases that are, that are involved in sensing from NLRs, different receptors. Um, so, and this is only a fraction of all the antagonism. Um, Oh, this is another good one. Sting is sending out an SOS. I guess the guy who named it was really a police fan, right? How could you just randomly run into this stuff? So plenty of uh, opportunities for antagonism. And in fact, studying the antagonism of these pathways by viral proteins have illuminated how they work. Okay, time for another um, question. Let me set this preference here first of all. This... Uh, slideshow allow app switching. I don't know why it went off. So, so when I say allow app switching, I could switch to the quiz without having to get out of the presentation, right? Next question. Which of the following allow the innate immune system to distinguish microbes from self? Cytoplasmic helicases and TLRs antibodies. Apoptosis. Apobec, all of the above. Okay, and let's Go back to some questions. Okay. Um, with adenovector DNA, why does the viral DNA not get silenced when it enters the host nucleus? There are the, the antagonists are still in that vector. And it hasn't been completely gutted. So it's always a race, right? So you're going to get some gene expression before silencing. But I think in the case of many of these ad vectors, a, a good number of the uh, viral proteins are still encoded in the genome, and so the, the antagonist may still be there. Do you see the use of CRISPR as one of the most consequential turning points? 
Uh, it depends on yeah, it could be in in theory, right? If we allow it to be used in certain ways, right? So it's going to be useful for for correcting ge genetic diseases and so forth, gene therapy. But if we let people plan features of their kids, no, that's not a good idea. So that would, but even if it's just used for gene therapy, yeah, it would be a turning point. As would recombinant DNA, which allowed all of this to happen as well. What's the difference between PAMP and epitope? So, so a PAMP is a pathogen-associated molecular pattern that's recognized by these sensors. That's, it's specific to these sensing mechanisms. So it could be a protein, it could be a, a nucleic acid. An epitope is something that is recognized by an antibody. So there could be some overlap, right? Some epitopes could be PAMPs or vice versa. But the use of the word is meant to indicate functionality, PAMP in the terms of sensing and epitope in, in, the, in the sense of uh, being recognized by an immune response. I read something to the effect of CRISPR-based therapies we're selecting for cells with cancer-related mutations. I don't, I'm not aware of that. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, so here's um, some German... Oh, d definitions of toll, huh? Yeah. You know, every year I give my lectures. I have someone in the audience who's German, and they... So last year we had a... And Vanity may remember, we had a German student in our class in the spring, and uh, she she gave us definitions. But you get the idea, right? Could we design antivirals which antagonize the viral antagonists? You could, but I'm not sure how productive that would be. I think it's probably better to be more specific for the virus, like a protease or a polymerase inhibitor, something like that. Which is better, our own immune system or the one from the vaccine? Well, the vaccine doesn't have an immune system. We have the immune system and the vaccine engages it, right? So there you go. Is that a herpes virion behind you? Now, why would I have a herpes virion behind me? Did I work on herpes virus? This is poliovirus. And this, I, I just brought it on Friday from my Columbia um, lab. I'm slowly bringing stuff. I should have had this for the uncoding lecture. Um, so this is a poli. It's an, actually an old model, which is made up of these plastic pieces that you put together. Uh, it was given to me by Ann Palmenberg, who's a virologist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Many, uh, a number of years ago, not too long ago, I visited her her lab, her office, and uh, she had uh, this, and, and this is the viral genome, which she put together in beads, each bead, right, four different color beads, and she strung them together for rhinovirus uh, yeah, I could put it here. You can see it better. She strung them together for rhinovirus according to the sequence. So I said, oh, my God, I have to have that for polio. So two years later, she sent it to me. She made it. It took her a while. But um, you can see, for example, here, here's the, here's the three prime end. How do I know that? You should be able to tell me how I know that's the three prime end, Okay. And you automatically know what red it codes for, right? Um, here at the five prime end is VPG. She put on a little, uh, a little. It's kind of a marble, and then she also put uh, magnets between the gene sets. Anyway, if you wanted me to get this out of the capsule, it would take me about two minutes to pull it all out, and this happens in microseconds in the cell. Isn't that amazing? Cool. It's very cool. So I've always meant to have it here, and. This is going to be a shelf of changing things because I don't have much. <laughs> the shelf is big, but not much shows up in the picture because I want to put another picture here. 
Sorry to digress. Um, okay. Um, is that the herpes virus? Where was that? Oh, it was way up. Wow. There I was thinking toll men like on a, a motorway. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Uh, polio has a poor. Jeff, you missed the lecture? I don't mean to pick on you. I just think it's funny. Yeah, polio induces, the receptor induces a poor uh, in polio. But here we just took out one of the subunits. It's not actually what happens in the real real life. took me an hour last week to figure out what toll meant. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, poly A. Jeff is the first to get it. The red is poly A tail, right? So the three prime end, it's all one base. And yeah, art and science. I, I do love it. I, I do like having my models and I'm going to be bringing more here. And your question is whether I bring all of them from home and leave nothing for Wednesday nights, you know? Okay, so fomites, we should have talked about last week in infection basics. Fomite is something you get an infection from that is a physical object that's contaminated, like a doorknob, a blanket, you know, some inanimate object that can hold some virus. You contaminate it by mucus or feces, whatever, and then that gives it, that's what a fomite is. Does RNA interference have an effect on the mRNA COVID vaccines? No, it apparently does not. It's it's not um, it's not double stranded RNA, uh, and and it's just seen as a normal messenger RNA. All right, let us see here what we have. Uh, I have to go back. There we go. Show the results. <clears throat> yes, cytoplasmic helicases in toll-like receptors allow the innate immune system to distinguish microbes from self. Not Innate immune system is the key here, right? Not antibodies. That's not innate. Not apoptosis. That's intrinsic. Apobec is intrinsic. So that's why. All right, let's talk about interference. These are some of the, these are cytokines. So cytokine is a broad term for uh, proteins produced uh, by our defense systems, in, innate included, um, cytokines. And one kind of cytokine is interferon. These were discovered in 1957 by Isaacs and Lindemann. Uh, these uh, were discovered. Actually, let me put myself here. Even though it gets rid of the bullets, no, nah, it does no good. Sorry. They exposed chicken cells to inactivated influenza virus. And they noticed in the supernatant of these cells, there was something that interfered with infection of other cells. They took the supernatant of cells that were just treated with inactivated influenza virus and put it on fresh cells and that inhibited infection of the other cells by infectious influenza virus. So they called it interferon. Oh, I think this is one of the best names in biology, interferon. It's like a sci-fi from the 50s, right? Interferon. And it is made by virus-infected cells. It's made by sentinel cells. What's a sentinel? Macrophages, dendritic cells, in response to products released from other cells. So you can have, here's our epithelial cell layer. Viruses are infecting it. Those cells will sense infection. They will initiate the synthesis of interferons, the red dots. And those and other cytokines will attract sentinel cells to the infected area. And the sentinels will in turn make more interferon. The sentinels make more interferon to try and clear the infection. So the sentinel is not infected, but it is responding to the virus infected cell producing cytokines and in turn it makes um, interferons. So these sentinels respond to things that are released from cells, apoptotic bodies, viral nucleic acids, viral proteins. As the cells are dying, they're releasing viral proteins and nucleic acids and those will activate the 
dendritic cell, for example, to make interferon and other cytokines, even though they're not infected. So you don't have to be infected to produce interferon. You just need to, the cell just needs to sense the presence of something foreign. There are three kinds of interferons, type one, type two, type three. Type ones are called alpha and beta, two different kinds of type one. Uh, there's interferon gamma, interferon lambda. Most cells produce interferons type one, alpha, beta. Interferon gamma is primarily restricted to immune cells, like T cells. Often, if you want to measure activation of T cell, you measure production of interferon gamma. And then lambda is thought to be a, an important defense at epithelial barriers. So these are three uh, interferon types that are produced um, when cells sense foreign by TLRs, RLRs, etc. The transcription of the genes encoding these proteins are turned on. The interferons are soluble proteins that in turn bind to receptors on the plasma membrane of cells. So here there is a type 1 interferon receptor. There's a, interfer there's a type 2 interferon receptor. The type 3, they're all dis they're distinct receptors that bind the interferons. And the binding initiates typically a phosphorylation cascade. It activates kinases that are associated with the cytosolic parts of these receptors, jacks and ticks, for example, and that initiates a cascade similar to those that occur uh, when uh, innate nucleic acid sensors, TLRs, for example, uh, bind a ligand. And the consequence is uh, synthesis of mRNAs encoding cytokines. And so here's a, an overview of interferon signal transduction. So we have a virus infecting a cell. It's, in this case, it's making RNA that's recognized by the Rig I system or MDA5. Uh, a series of phosphorylation events occurs. Remember, I told you that these cytosolic helicases act signal through MAVs on mitochondria. They also signal through MAVs on peroxisomes. These are oxidative uh, vet membrane vesicles in the cell. They have membrane proteins they end up phosphorylating interferon regulatory factors, which are basically transcription factors that go in the nucleus uh, after they're phosphorylated and activate the synthesis of mRNAs for interferons, alpha, beta, lambda. These are epithelial cells, so no gamma. gamma. Uh, the mRNA is shipped out to the cytosol. The protein is made. The protein secreted. It comes out of the cell and binds receptors on, it could bind to receptors on itself or a neighboring cell. And that binding is, initiates another signaling pathway which activates transcription proteins. They go in the nucleus and they activate the transcription of genes called interferon stimulated genes. I, uh, so I, I said a few minutes ago that it activates the synthesis of cytokines. That's not correct. Interferon signal transduction activates the synthesis of interferon-stimulated genes. And those are the ones that have antiviral activity. So interferon binding to receptors leads to synthesis of over 1,000 cell proteins called ISGs. Mechanisms of most of them are not known. I'm going to tell you about a few in a moment. And um, one of them is shown here, breaking a virus capsid, for example. So one of them can do that. But this uh, production of interferon alpha beta is rapid within hours of infection that goes way up and then declines by 10 hours because you don't want to be making interferons all the time, as you will see. Here's another story of exapted viral genes. You remember endogenous retroviruses, right? The remnants of old retrovirus infections in our genomes, either integrated in our genome, in our germline, they're called endogenous retroviruses, they have LTRs, gag pole envelope in the human germline. We have many of these, but they don't make infectious particles. Over time, the LTRs of these ERVs have been repurposed to serve as promoters for ISGs. How about that? So the LTRs, as you know, contain a promoter for, for the retroviral uh, genome. And those have been moved around our genome, and they serve as promoter elements for interferon-stimulated genes. 
So LTRs contain motifs that respond to innate immune signals like interferon. Um, they, have, they occupy about 6 to 14% of mammalian genomes. And they have this kind of repurposing has happened for many different mammals, as you can see here in this little diagram. These are millions of years. These little boxes are the time of, that we estimate that the endogenous retrovirus LTR was repurposed to drive interferon-stimulated gene expression. These are part of what we call gas motifs. motifs. Uh, uh, these are the motifs present in the promoters that respond to those transcription factors that go in the nucleus as a, as a consequence of interferon binding to receptors. And so these motifs have parts of LTRs in them. And humans, obviously our ancestors uh, repurposed these because it's over 50 million years ago. Lemurs, rodents, bats, etc. They've all done this. They've taken, just like mammals uh, with placentas have taken syncytion to make the placenta, now you see they've taken parts of the LTR to make the interferon response system. Amazing, isn't it? So this is in part what Nels LD works on in his lab, and we did a TWIV a long time ago. Everyone's a little bit viral. Hmm. Another, all right, so let's go through some um, interferon-stimulated genes and what they do. As I said, there are over a 1,000, so we're not going to go through all of them. Just a few to give you an idea. First one is tetherin, which is a transmembrane protein that essentially makes viruses stick to the surface. So here's a retrovirus budding from a cell, and there are four tetherins. They, they act as dimers. You can see they're, both ends of tetherin have transmembrane signals, so they combine both the plasma membrane and the newly budded virus, and that causes long chains of virus, excuse me, to occur, and they never get away from the cell. Here's an electron micrograph of the effect of tetherin. Uh, on, so this is taken by Paul Benash, I believe, a number of years ago. And here are the, the HIV particles in chains. They can't get away from the cell, and many massive amounts of particles. So this obviously inhibits infectivity. So you may ask again, just like with Apobec, how, how do we have an, an age pandemic if this tetherin is so effective? Well, the virus encodes a protein called VPU. Remember, VIF was the apobec antagonist. VPU is the tetherin antagonist. It prevents it from getting to the membrane, and the virus particles are free to leave. Right? There's always an antagonist. Another one is IFIT. I Interferon-induced protein with tetratricopeptide repeats. IFIT-1, that's what IFIT stands for. Tetratricopeptide is a kind of protein re amino acid repeat. IFIT-1 binds RNAs lacking 2 prime O methylation. And you may be saying, what, Professor, what the hell is 2 prime O methylation? And I will tell you, we did talk about it, but we'll go over it again. Remember, the 5 prime end of M mRNAs is typically capped with a G linked by a 5 to 5 prime linkage with 3 phosphates in between to the first base on the RNA. And another feature of a cap is methylation on the 2 prime O. These are two methyls on the 2 prime O of the ribose. There's another methyl up here, but it's on the, the nitrogen of the base. IFIT recognizes and binds to RNAs lacking 2 prime O methyl. So here's an IFIT binding an mRNA that lacks 2 prime O methyl. And that binding will prevent the cap binding protein from binding to the cap and therefore the ribosome will never come and this mRNA will never get translated. So the effect of IFIT is to block translation of certain RNAs. So the idea here is that the cellular mRNAs are all, they're all methylated at this 2 prime O. But maybe some viral RNAs are not. Here's, by the way, two structures of IFIT uh, bound to, well, it's, here's the M7G uh, binding 
um, in IFID. IFID is the protein on the outside, shown here with, with all the alpha helices as tubes. And you can see, the, even though I've, I've just put the blob of IFID here on the left, it actually is very sophisticated. The, the cap, the M7G cap, fits in a tunnel in IFID. And you can see that tunnel nicely here. The IFID is shown in solid view, and the uh, M7G, the cap, fits in a nice tunnel. So it really blocks the cap so that there's no way that the translational machinery can recruit the ribosome to the 5' prime end of mRNAs. How do viruses escape from it? Because obviously viruses have to, otherwise they wouldn't exist. Well, influenza virus, I mean, look at this. Remember, the mRNAs of influenza virus are primed with pieces of cellular mRNAs. So those are cellular caps, so they're 2 prime O-methylated, escape from IFIT. Picornaviruses have a protein at the 5 prime end. I showed it to you on the little model uh, behind me, the protein on the 5 prime end. So there's no cap. There's nowhere for IFIT to bind, escape from IFIT. Many viruses have, and genomes have an RNA structure in the form of a stem loop that's very close to the cap that physically prevents IFIT from binding, escape from IFIT. And look at this, many viral genomes encode methylases that methylate the 2 prime O, so they escape from IFIT. These viruses do that. And finally, some virus have arranged to steal methylases, 2 prime O methylases from the host to methylate their own mRNAs. So it was pretty, I guess it was pretty easy to get around this. There are some viruses that are inhibited by it, but as you can see, <laughs> many of the major pathogens are not. Finally, one more, IFID M3. So IFID stands for the same set of words as we just talked about. I interferon-induced protein with tetra trichopeptide repeats, except this is M3 because M3 inhibits fusion during virus entry. Here is the, the structure, the topology of, M th of this IFID M3. It has a C-terminal transmembrane domain and then a, a part that's not associated. And then it has another part of the protein that's inserted in the membrane to, and it, what this does is, is deforms the membrane. You can see it's bending it, and the phospholipids here are being bent. And so this inhibits fusion. So here is a diagram of fusion. Rem remember, when viruses are taken up by um, the endocytic pathway, eventually uh, they, um, well, the, 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 the vesicles that form have to pinch off from the plasma membrane. That's a form of fusion that's blocked by IFIT. And then the virus uh, endosome fusion is also blocked by IFIT. And the mechanism is shown here. Here's a viral membrane and a host cell membrane. And remember, the fusion proteins and the virus insert into the host cell membrane. They undergo conformational changes. They cause uh, fusion of the inner bilayer. But because IFIT is deforming the outer bilayer here, it can't undergo that second fusion step. So fusion is blocked essentially by this protein deforming uh, the membrane. Quite, quite a clever uh, inhibitor. All right, so those are a couple of uh, interference-stimulated genes, but over a thousand. Why so many? I think some of them are cell type specific, some of them are virus specific. But one message that you should understand here is that the interferon system is dangerous. You see this this guy here with fever and you know runny nose and so forth. That's all interferon. Interferon induces the expression of many what I would call deleterious gene products because most of our cells have interferon receptors and they can respond to them. And these gene products have consequences like fever, chills, nausea, malaise, lack of appetite, muscle aches, brain fog, you name it. Those are, those are things caused by interferons and the proteins they induce. 
every virus infection results in interferon production, some more than others, because many viruses antagonize the production of interferon. So SARS-CoV-2 is very good at antagonizing the production of interferon. If you treat cells with interferon in the lab and infect with SARS-CoV-2, the virus is inhibited. But in a human, the virus is inhibiting the production of interferon. But every virus induces interferon to some extent, and that's why flu-like symptoms are so common. So flu-like symptom has really little to do with just influenza virus. They were first noted for influenza, fever, chills, malaise, nausea, etc. But they happen with most virus infections, and they're caused by interferons. They're not caused by the virus directly doing things to cell. They are caused by interferon. So the next time you get flu-like symptoms, it's because the virus is tickling these receptors and turning on the synthesis of interferon, which in turn are activating other protein synthesis, and that's what gives you the symptoms. All right. <clears throat> Quiz time, last one. How do interferons limit virus replication? Interferons directly inhibit viral translation. They lyse viral particles. They induce interferon-stimulated genes. They damage cells, none of the above. Let's go back to the questions. I think you can get polio earrings. You can get almost any virus earrings, yeah. <laughs> Is mucus color? <laughs> good. So typically, clear mucus is good. If it get cloudy or thick or purulent or colored, it means you have uh, a common, you may have a bacterial infection, or it may simply be the immune cells that are lysing in there. Um, so clear is typically early on, and then later on, as lots of infiltrate of immune cells occurs, it gets more cloudy. But that's working. It means that it's working. If it gets green, then you probably have a bacterial infection, which is not good. Can LTRs be used to differentiate between human populations that have been separated a long time? I would say yes, they could be um, because they're lineage specific as you saw on that slide. Yes, LTRs, long terminal repeat, uh, part of the, both ends of the retroviral genome, yep. Yes, uh, this is all moves and counter moves, absolutely. Can we quantify escape from IFIT-1? Yes, you could, if you had IFIT-1 protein, you could add it to, you could simply make an mRNA with a easily measured reporter, like green fluorescent protein or a luciferase, and then you could have different five prime ends, caps, and see the effect of adding the protein, sure, in a, in a translation system. Thank you, Sugar. I, I very I love this stuff. And every year I get more excited about it. It's really interesting because when I first started, I was excited, but it didn't show it as much. And how you know, starting to teach undergraduates taught me. It just didn't teach me. It just came naturally when I when I started teaching. Does interference help minimize the spread of virus because we feel sick and stay at home? I, you know, I don't think so because um, many people, even with these mild symptoms, don't stay at home. It's only when they – it depends on the person, right? Your stay at home is different from someone else's. So I don't think it really impacts it. Um, of course, if you're very sick, then you end up in hospital. And that's where SARS-1, you know, most people ended up in the hospital when they were shedding, and so it didn't transmit very well. So it's all related. So interferon, of course, has been used as an antiviral, yes, but it has very poor side effects. So it was used to treat hepatitis C for many years, but many patients stopped taking it because the side effects are so miserable, and so now we have direct-acting antivirals, which is much better. 
So yes, you could use interferon, but it's typically, typically, well, for hep C, it would be an extended therapy. So there you get the this undesirable side effects. Um, but direct acting antivirals are typically better. Could we design inter artificial interferon responses and put them in our genome? Yes, you could. Um, but I, I don't, I'm not sure that that would be approved. We don't know the outcome, and we, we don't know how long it would take for viruses to counter it, right? It might be very quick. Did fever inhibit uh, SARS-CoV-2? I don't think so. I mean, the idea is that high temperatures can inhibit some virus infections, right? But, I mean, maybe that's part of the reason for the, you know, in, in most, in 80% of SARS-CoV-2 infections, it's a relatively rapid course of virus production. You know, high peak of production in the upper tract, shedding, so transmission occurs, and then rapid decline. Maybe the fever is part of that, but you also have innate responses and adaptive responses, although less adaptive because it's, too quick, um, maybe T cells. So the contribution of fever is logical, but I don't really know how much of it it is. If you have a virus infection that's asymptomatic, does that mean interferons haven't been induced? So that's a good question because you know you would feel the symptoms of uh, fever and malaise and nausea and muscle ache and so forth. So. Uh, I would say, yeah, you probably, you know, the threshold of interferon for making those responses probably differs in different people, but you've probably had a very low amount of uh, interferon for an asymptomatic infection. Yeah, that's a good point. A little esoteric, but actually pretty interesting. I think, yeah, you could say that a lot about science. There are many things that are esoteric in the stuff I've told you today, but it's actually quite interesting. Given the ubiquity of flu-like symptoms produced by us in, by interfering, what are some examples of actual virus-induced symptoms? So, you know, even coughing is not really virus-induced. Maybe, uh, so the, in influenza, there's you can have some substernal pain after uh, infection that may be de caused by virus destroying epithelial cells, virus destruction of the liver. Uh, but in many cases, it's actually immune-based. Polio, maybe polio-induced paralysis is a good one. Um destruction of neurons, gastroenteritis viruses, viruses causing uh, diarrhea, damage of the intestinal epithelia by viruses. Mm. So those are two. It could go on, but you get the idea. Does it make sense that every flu-like case is tested and the result? Well, I don't think every flu-like case is tested. Many go untested. It seems viruses eventually mutate to escape all innate immune defenses. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. I think um, the problem is that people are all different genetically, right? So some have really good innate systems and others have not so good ones. So if you make a really strong innate response before a virus can get going and produce countermeasures, it's eliminated. That's why so many infections end or asymptomatic. You have a robust innate response. So it's only when the, the innate response is poor, then the virus gets going and it overwhelms. Okay, so I don't think your negativity is, is actually correct. Is there a correlation between the amount of interferon response and whether or not a person's immune system has seen the virus in the past? No, there's no, there's no, met, well, listen, I shouldn't say no. Some immunologists think there's some kind of innate training going on, but it's not part of my lecture yet. I'm not, I'm not convinced. As far as I can see, there's no innate memory. Thank you, John, for your contribution. Really appreciate it.
Yeah, so sh Shingrix is particularly um, high on the side effects. And so those the, the initial one is going to be interferon mediated, but the second one may be a memory response involving antibodies and T cells. I, I don't think that's the case. Does it mean mature dendritic cells cannot sense only immature? I think the receptors remain, but we'll see that in the next slide. It's a good question. Uh, the destruction of CD4 cells by HIV infection. Yes, there would. that's where you die of uh, opportunistic infections in the end by destruction. So the symptoms, yeah, I guess that would be a good one too, yep. Is vaccine reactivity caused by interference? I think that's part of it, yeah, for sure. Okay, let's go back to our slides. Oops, quiz, sorry. What's the answer? Uh, the interferons induce ISGs. That's how they limit virus replication. In interferons themselves have no antiviral activity. They do not lyse virus particles. They do not damage cells. That's not how they limit virus replication. They induce other genes, thousand, over a thousand, and they have antiviral activity as we have discussed today. The sentinel cells include dendritic cells, macrophages, and natural killer cells. They patrol our tissues and they look for signs of change, something that would indicate an infection, for example. So here uh, uh, on the, these are, these, are, these are dendritic cells here on the left. They're so named and they were discovered because they kind of look neuronal, right, with dendrites of a cell body in these long processes. These are typical of an activated dendritic cell, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, and uh, here, and that dendritic cell is, is next to a normal cell. And here is an NK cell uh, snuggling up to a cell. So these are two kinds of sentinels, including macrophages, which aren't illustrated here. Dendritic cells are all over you. They're different kinds. Uh, here, you can see on the lower left, we have dendritic cells in the blood with different markers on them and different functions. A plasmacytoid, for example, is a dendritic cell that makes a lot of interferon when it senses an um, infected cell. There are tissue dendritic cells, Langerhans cells in the skin, dermal and submucosal dendritic cells. Uh, these patrol all over you. They're constantly circulating in all parts of you at any given time, and they're looking for signs of infection. So for example, here in your intestine, here's your epithelial barrier. There are um, dendritic cells, the blue and the purple, uh, in the subepithelial spaces. They even send processes through between the epithelial cells into the lumen of the gut. What are they looking for? They're looking for peptides or proteins. And they will then bring those back to the lymph node because the dendritic cell itself is not going to say whether it's foreign or not. It may pick up a self-peptide. What does determine if it's foreign are the T cells in the T cell zone of the lymph node. The dendritic cells will present whatever they've discovered and how that happens we'll see in a moment. They present that to a T cell in the lymph node. Here's a micrograph of this happening. So the dendritic cell is green, you can see with, with its processes. It's right next to a T cell, which is blue. They're right next to each other. So the dendritic cell is basically presenting a peptide to the T cell, and the T cell will react uh, in a way depending on whether it's a foreign peptide or not. So we have dendritic cells in here in our intestine, at epithelial barriers, skin, eye, vagina, all over. There are dendritic cells that are patrolling and looking for signs of change, and then they go back to the lymph nodes and inform the T cells of what's going on. So here we have our epithelial sh cell sheet. Um, 
here, the virus is infecting the epithelial cells. The cells are going to sense infection, right, by the TLRs, etc. They're going to produce cytokines, including interferons. The cytokines will attract sentinel cells to this infected area. Here's an immature dendritic cell. It will also be activated by proteins, nucleic acids released from the infected cell. So if these are dying cells, they're going to release viral proteins, viral nucleic acids, and as you will see in a moment, the dendritic cells have receptors for those. So they have RLRs and so forth, and they can become activated, and they will become mature dendritic cells. So they're producing cytokines at the site of infection, but eventually they become activated. They will go to the lymph node where they will interact with T cells. And if the peptide that they're presenting to the T cell is foreign, then eventually you will have antibodies and T cells produced that uh, are part of the adaptive response, which we'll talk about on Wednesday. So this is the connection between the innate and the adaptive immune system. Here's, here's how dendritic cells are activated. So here's an immature dendritic cell. These are the forms of dendritic cells that are patrolling your body, your tissues. They have uh, receptors for cytokines. They can pick up dead and dying cells, pieces of dead and dying cells produced by infection or apoptosis. Uh, they have toll-like receptors. They have cytokine receptors. And they have in their endosomes uh, MHC class 2 and they can produce interferon to help eliminate the infection. They, say, pick up pieces of dead and dying cells. The proteins are processed in the dendritic cell and chopped up into small peptides, which are these orange uh, rectangles here, which are loaded into MHC, major histocompatibility complex class II proteins, uh, which will end up on the surface of the dendritic cell once it becomes activated. So all of these signals uh, lead to an activated state of the dendritic cell where it now looks like a dendritic cell with the, with the processes. The MHC is now on the plasma membrane. We call these mature dendritic cells. This dendritic cell goes to a lymph node in the T cell zone. It will interact with a naive T cell, which has not seen a peptide before. And a, and a synapse forms where uh, T cell and dendritic cell proteins uh, interact. The MHC bearing the viral peptide interacts with the T cell receptor. Now, the T cell receptor is also polymorphic, which means that there are many different ones as there are <laughs> MHCs. Uh, and if this peptide is recognized by a T cell receptor, the T cell becomes activated and then will go out into your body, it will help make antibodies, it will lyse virus infected cells. If the peptide is self, it will not find a T-cell receptor to interact with because all those self-recognizing T-cells were eliminated early in your embryonic development, in your immune system development, by eliminating all the self-reactive T-cells in the thymus. So only a foreign peptide will find a T-cell receptor. Now, this is not always true. You know, autoimmune diseases, we often have self-reactive T-cells, and, and that's uh, not the normal state. So these T cells, the, the dendritic cells, they don't know if this peptide is foreign, but the T cell will detect that, and if it's foreign, it is activated. We also have NK cells that are part of the picture. These are sentinels as well. Uh, NK cells can, uh, can kill a virus-infected cell because these virus-infected cells typically lack MHC molecules on their surface. Many virus infections downregulate MHC on the cell surface because, as you'll see next time, it is by the MHC molecule bearing a viral peptide that the T cell, the cytotoxic T cell, will kill a virus infected cell. So <laughs> viruses downregulate these um, um, MHC molecules. So the NK cells have two receptors on their surfaces, an activating and inhibitory receptor. Uh, so if the cell that they recognize uh, has an MHC on its surface, it will not be killed. If it does not have an MHC 
molecule, the cell will be killed. The assumption is the virus has downregulated MHC, so therefore it should be killed, and that's shown by the lysis here. And so the activating receptor induces killing, uh, and the absence of MHC leads to killing, whereas if MHC is present, the uh, inhibitory receptor will then override the activating receptor, and this cell is not killed. Now, you may ask, why is this MHC here? Well, not all viruses downregulate uh, MHC, and some viruses actually put up their own mimic of an MHC to fool the NK receptor. And so there are modulators of MK cells as well, and that's one of them, to put up a decoy uh, of the MHC, which doesn't function as an MHC in the sense that it doesn't present a peptide, but uh, it does inhibit NK cell killing. Complement is another part of the uh, innate pathway. It's a, it's a series of proteins with all names like C2, C4, C3 convertase, so forth, that can recognize uh, foreign molecules. For example, uh, we, in many cases, Antibodies produced during infection will bind a microbe, and this particular part of complement C1 will recognize those antibodies and can lead to lysis of the microbe or uptake by macrophages. So, for example, the, a lot of these complement proteins undergo a cascade of cleavage, and here at the end, a membrane complex can be formed that will lyse the microbe or lyse the virus if it's an envelope virus. These proteins can coat microbes and lead to their uptake by macrophages and, and eventually destruction. That's called opsonization. And then many of the cleavage products of the complement pathway can lead to inflammation, the production of cytokines and so forth. So complement can recognize antibodies. They can recognize carbohydrates. Uh, and lead to um, elimination. Now, you may ask, what's the, how can there be antibodies here? Well, there is a class of antibodies that are against carbohydrates on pathogens that are always present, but also if you have a memory response, then that can collaborate with complement to help eliminate a pathogen. And yes, there are viral modulators of all the complement uh, proteins as well. So all of this should make it clear that Infection leads to the inflammatory response. Cell, infected cells produce cytokines and chemokines, and that leads to what we call inflammation. Inflammation was originally de de described by the Roman Celsus in the first century AD. And that uh, medical encyclopedia said, inflammation consists of rubor, dolor, calor, and tumor. That is redness, pain, heat, and swelling, the four classic signs of inflammation, and they are caused by increased blood flow, increased capillary permeability, the influx of phagocytic cells, and tissue damage. It's all caused by the cytokines and the chemokines that are induced by the innate response, and that is what is inflammation. Inflammation is not just caused by infection. So here's, here's a slide I downloaded from the internet. I said, what's inflammation? Give me an image. And this is what I got. Inflammation is part of cancer, cardiovascular diseases, Alzheimer's, pulmonary disease, arthritis, autoimmune diseases, neurological diseases, diabetes. But what's missing? It's also part of infection. A lot of things induce inflammation. You have a muscle injury. The, the, your, cyst, your body's going to respond to try and repair it. It will involve inflammation, these four signs that are caused by uh, the cytokines and chemokines. And these are the three classes of cytokines involved. We have a group of what we call pro-inflammatory cytokines, like IL-1, TNF, IL-6. Remember IL-6? We tried to antagonize it to treat COVID-19 to get rid of some of the inflammatory syndrome that occurs after the primary viral phase. Uh, these pr largely promote the activation of uh, white blood cells, like T cells. Then we have anti-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, 
like IL-10-4 and TGF-beta, which suppress the pro-inflammatory cytokines because you have to control this. You cannot have runaway pro-inflammatory cytokines, but in some diseases you do. That's called cytokine storm, and that is, you know, severe COVID. So it's not controlled for some reason. And then we have chemokines like IL-8, which recruit immune cells. So we have a, here a tissue that's been infected with the virus. The cells are producing chemokines as a result of the activities we've discussed today. They're producing cytokines. The chemokines attract white blood cells from the blood vessels. These white blood cells adhere to the wall of the, of the uh, blood vessel and they squeeze through and they go into the area that's infected to try and resolve the infection. And so that movement of cells is part of inflammation, the swelling, the pain, uh, is part of the inflammatory process as these chemokines and cytokines attract cells. So these cytokines and chemokines, they're, they're initially produced locally, right? You have an infection of the intestine, the, they're produced there, but they get into the circulation and they can go everywhere in your body. And that's why they have global effects. That's why you have flu-like symptoms, sleepiness, lethargy, muscle pain, ap loss of appetite, nausea. A localized infection produces global effects. Even though the virus is localized, you can have a headache from a GI infection because of cytokines, okay? So people t talk about stomach flu, right? There's no stomach flu, but you may have intestinal upset as a consequence of influenza or some other virus infection. So that's important to recognize that these chemokines and cytokines they have global effects, which are not always nice. And that's why we don't, treating people with interferon isn't great. Here's an example of how these uh, cytokines work. So a cytokine has a receptor on some host cell for sure. It binds the receptor, initiates a signaling pathway typically involving phosphorylation of a transcription factor that goes in the nucleus and stimulates the production of the effector genes, whatever is the target of the particular uh, cytokine, we'll see what it is in a moment, the biological response. So here's an example of a white blood cell that is gonna go through the uh, capillary wall and get to the tissue where there's an infection. So there's some infection in the underlying tissue. The white blood cells initially start rolling, they, they get activated, they stop, and then they move through into the underlying tissues outside of the blood vessel where the infection is occurring. And the molecular events that lead to that are shown here. Uh, you have, for example, production of chemokines uh, in, in, in the endothelium. The chemokines bind to receptors on, in this case, a neutrophil that's moving through the blood. Uh, the, this induces the synthesis of an integrin, which will then bind to a receptor on the red blood cell and that gets the neutrophil to attach and eventually move through. So this is one example of what a chemokine uh, will do to in cause inflammation, but more importantly, to attempt to resolve the infection. Viruses, of course, encode cytokine countermeasures, and there are three different classes here. There's some that interrupt the production of cytokines and chemokines. So intracellular mechanisms to prevent translation, the processing of proteins, the secretion. And of course, you don't get functional proteins when that happens. But viruses also encodes, encode uh, homologs of cytokines. These are secreted proteins. They're virus-encoded secreted proteins that look like cytokines. They can bind the cytokine receptor, but there's no function so here, when we saw this cytokine binding its receptor, viruses can make a homolog, which will bind, but there's no downstream effect. So they're basically blocking the receptor. And virus genomes also encode soluble cytokine receptors. They're floating around in our fluids that bind up all the uh, bona fide cytokines and prevent them from acting. Amazing, it's amazing. Most of these are in the genome of large DNA viruses. And then there's some that uh, viral proteins that interfere with signaling pathways, as we sh saw here, downstream of cytokine binding to receptors.
Now, inflammation is important because it usually is associated with potent immune responses. Cytopathic viruses, that is viruses that kill cells, cause inflammation because they break the cell, they cause tissue and cell damage, and those pieces of the cell are picked up by dendritic cells and macrophages and can be sampled in the lymph node. So that kind of damage activates the innate response and leads to a better adaptive response. So that's why viruses that kill cells, cytopathic viruses, their genomes encode proteins that modulate the uh, cytokine and chemotine, chemokine responses I've just listed for you. Typically adenoviruses, herpes viruses, pox viruses, they damage cells, so they need to encode antagonists of the inflammatory response. On the other hand, there are many viruses that don't kill cells. These are caused these are called non-cytopathic viruses. Cells are not damaged. There's no apoptosis or necrosis, no programmed cell death. And as a consequence, we have pretty poor innate responses. Why? Because the cells are not releasing damaged uh, pieces of them. They're not releasing viral nucleic acids and proteins. So the sentinels can't sense the infection. Certainly, the infected cells can produce interferon, but there's not a global activation uh, of the immune response, and the adaptive response is poor as a consequence. So these viruses, these non-cytopathic viruses, they have very different interactions with the host immune system. They often cause long-term persistent infections. They are inefficiently cleared because we don't have a, a good adaptive response. So the lesson here, for my last 10 minutes of talking, this inflammatory response, which is characterized by heat, swelling, redness, and pain, those are the four signs of the inflammatory response. That reflects the communication of the innate and adaptive systems. If you don't have a good inflammatory response, you have poor adaptive responses. And this is why we use, or one reason why we use adjuvants for many non-infectious vaccines. The vaccines do not reproduce. They do not kill cells, so we don't have inflammation. So we add an adjuvant which causes inflammation so that we get a better antibody and T cell response. And we, we'll visit adjuvants when we talk about vaccines. And finally, not all inflammation is caused by infection. I told you this some time ago, uh, just 10 minutes ago, I think. And here's a great example of that, which combines inflammation with a, a good vaccine response. When you get the, when we used to give to most people the smallpox vaccine, it was given in a bifurcated needle. There's a little drop of vaccine in the needle and the needle is used to scrape your epidermis. So actually they, they damage your epidermis. You cause a little scrape which is shown here as an injury. And then the virus gets into the cells and begins to reproduce. But this scraping causes inflammation on its own. This is an infectious virus, but in fact, the scraping causes inflammation above what the virus would do, which causes the production of cytokines and chemokines. This attracts immune cells out of the blood vessels. And this is actually why, the, in part, the smallpox vaccine is so good because of the scratching. They've done experiments in rabbits where they administer a vaccine by scraping, by scarification, or by injecting the vaccine with a needle. And the needle doesn't cause anywhere near as much inflammation, and so the immune response is, is much, much lower. So I think this is a great example or a great illustration of what I've been trying to tell you, that inflammation is a reflection of innate adaptive communication and it is needed to have a great adaptive response. And finally, remember, all viruses must encode at least one regulator of intrinsic and innate defenses. That includes sensing, interferon production, interferon signal transduction, cytokines, chemokines, NK cells, dendritic cells, complement. They all have to be antagonized in some way Otherwise, the virus is gone. It's really an amazing immune system. So what we talked about today are the earliest defenses, 
the virus infects an epithelial barrier. Infection is sensed. Cytokines are produced. The cytokines include interferon, which induce the production of interferon-stimulated antiviral genes. At the same time, uh, immune cells are recruited to the infected area, including dendritic cells, which become activated and bring fragments of what they pick up here into the lymph node where they're queried by T cells. Uh, and if the, the antigen is foreign, then we have the generation of antibodies and T cells, which we will talk about next time. On Wednesday, we'll discuss the outcome of this, which of course is adaptive uh, immunity. Let's see, now let's get back to some questions here. Does interferon cause lung damage? Certainly the um, production of cytokines and chemokines is, is a major part of the severe lung damage in many virus infections, including avian influenza virus, uh, SARS-1, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. So yes, um, <clears throat> not just interferon though, but the interferon stimulated genes and many of the chemokines and, and cytokines. And exactly which one for COVID, we don't know. That's why a broad inhibitor of, of inflammation like steroids is more effective than precise inactivation of, say, IL-6. I felt symptoms last week didn't get tested. Testing every time you're feeling symptoms can be expensive. Well, yes, that is why cheap or free testing should be available to everybody. We just, you know, we don't get this. The people controlling the purses don't get this. It would really help. The shelf looks great, maybe more models. Yeah, I, I can only bring in a few at a time. Um, and that's a light. I'm experimenting with different colors of light. Uh, I have a light here that I can change colors. Uh, yeah, I'll be playing with it, yep. Thank you. Glad you like it. Thank you, John, for your contribution. Vincent in the mods. Yeah, it does sound like a rock band. How are self-reactive T cells eliminated? Uh, so in the thymus during development, early development, um, the T cells, so you make T cells that basically can react with every peptide known to molecular biology, right? And then the T cells that then the, they are presented with every possible peptide from the human proteome in the developing thymus. And those T cells that have a T cell receptor that react with a self peptide, they're killed by apoptosis. I mean, that's a very simplified summary, oversimplified summary, but that's the idea that the self reactive T cells are eliminated by apoptosis in the thymus. I thought B cells make antibodies. Yes, they do. I didn't say the T cells make them, but the T cells provide help to B cells. CD4 positive T cells provide help to B cells so that they can make antibodies. And so those CD those CD4 positive T cells, you know, they're produced in the lymph node. They're activated by a DC, a dendritic cell presenting an antigen, and then they go out and they help the production of uh, B cells. DCs remain immature until activated. Yes, they don't mature automatically. They're, they, they're matured by infection, for example, as we talked about today. How is natural cell death not triggering inflammation? Well, if you have an excess of cell death, then it would, yes. But if there's just a few cells here and there, it's, yeah, it's dealt with and you never know that, you never feel it. That's right. Do we have interferon inhibitors available in the market? I'm not aware of any, no. See, IL-6 is too specific. I think you need a broader one. That's why steroid, dexamethasone, has found good use for COVID, severe COVID, because it's a blunter. It's a broad blunter. But you can't give it too early, otherwise it'll blunt your ability to regulate infection. Could autoimmunity arise after viral infection? Yes, absolutely. So. It's been postulated that some antibodies to viral epitopes could react with self 
or viral infection could expose uh, normally cryptic self peptides in some way that they then have T cells that react with them is absolutely yes. Uh, with the DNA and RNA SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, how do sentinels have spike on their surface? So uh, there are two ways. So the the sentinel could pick up the lipid nanoparticle vaccine. It could be the protein could be produced in the sentinel, processed, and then presented on MHC2. I'm going to have a slide on that in our vaccine lecture. Or they could pick up. They can actually pick up some of the spike from the surface of another cell. Uh, Dendritic cells are able to do that. The difference between a chemokine and a cytokine. So chemokines are generally involved in the attracting of other cells to the infected area, where cytokines have, do not in, in attract cells, but they have other effects like um, inducing the synthesis of uh, proteins needed for cellular function. If vaccine reactivity is caused by interference, how do you explain lack of reaction to the vaccine? Well, <clears throat> this is because, as I said, humans are genetically polymorphic. Not everyone has a really good or highly tuned innate response. Some people react very well. They get strong um, vaccine reactions and others don't. You have some changes in your proteins, and there are a lot of them, as you saw today, that simply make a, a less um, obvious response, but you're still making a response. It's not zero. Could we use viral cytokine countermeasures to try and control storms? Yeah, well, you need to know what cytokines are the problem, right? And that's not easy because there are a lot of them. And you most likely would need more than one. It would differ for different viruses, and it might also differ from person to person. So I think it's pretty complicated to do that. But people are trying to do that for sure. Can you give an example of a non-cytopathic virus? So um, uh, hepatitis B virus is not cytopathic. Um, most retroviruses outside of HIV are not cytopathic. The damage mainly caused by the immune response. We're going to talk more about that when we talk about pathogenesis. Non-cytopathic virus means it does not cause much harm. I would not say that because the virus itself infecting cells does not cause damage, but the immune response does cause damage. And the immune response, of course, is induced by virus infection. So I wouldn't let the virus off the hook, if you understand what I mean. So varicella zoster is a cytopathic virus, but it has other, it does persist in nerves, yes. And it, that's because of other mechanisms that we will talk about when we talk about persistence. So stay with the course, we'll talk about it. And yes, uh, Edward Jenner had some insight. Now, he didn't use a bifurcated needle. That was a more recent um, adaptation. But he did scrape the material into the skin. I don't know why he did that. Maybe he thought that since the, the milkmaids had skin lesions and smallpox patients have skin lesions, that that's where he should put the virus. Maybe he didn't know it was spread by the respiratory route. Yeah. The slide on compliment passed over me. Well, um, complement is a series of proteins in the serum that can mediate recognition of foreign uh, markers, as do the TLRs, for example, and have outcomes such as poking a hole in a membrane, um, causing something coated with antibodies to be taken up by macrophages, um, and so that's, they have antiviral roles. I know I didn't spend a lot of time on it, but uh, if you have the textbook, you can read more about it there. We have to, in this very quick course, we can't go into all details, right? Dubis Yatol. Cool. <laughs> that's neat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Could have put toll and rack and yellow together. <laughs> 
What present antigen to activate B cells? Well, the antigen is could be the virus, um, but uh, the, the, so when could be virus antigen or peptides that have been released from infected cells. Yeah. Thank you, Barb Mack, for your contribution. The B cell question we'll get back to next on Wednesday. Okay. The phage looks like it's injecting nucleic. It does, doesn't it? It's, I, I moved it there because you couldn't see it anywhere else. But it's also a little squished. It's a little too big. I, it was nicer on the couch, but there's no way I can get a couch in here. Oh, well. Thank you, Kathy, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. How does COVID-19 cause a cytokine storm? Well, we don't know. We do know there's a cytokine storm. There's overproduction of cytokines and chemokines. One of the ideas is that the people who go on to these severe COVID, they have a poor interferon response, which does not limit virus reproduction initially, and consequently it gets out of control, and that gives you an overstimulating of uh, innate responses. That's one of the ideas, but by no means certified. Would I have time to sign a book after myself? Of course, absolutely. I mean, I'm going to try and work out some time to spend with the you and Rima, who I understand are both there. So stay tuned. I'm working on it. Just wondering, aging uh, lessens the efficiency of our immune system. Is there research towards slowing that process or preventing it? <laughs> slowing aging? Yeah, there's some people who think they can interfere with aging. Um, but you know, f slowing the aging of the immune system is a tough one. What we could possibly do is make better vaccines that get around that. And that's, you know, for some vaccines, that's the idea. But I think fixing the aging part is really hard. <laughs> so anti-idiotypic antibodies would be, so say you have an antibody and you make an antibody to the variable region, the combining site, which would then recognize the original um, epitope, basically. So that could be involved in autoimmunity, I think. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yes, this is a good uh, animation from the last uh, TWIV, uh, Brienne's pick on the last TWIV. Thank you, Lusik, for your contribution. I really appreciate it. I haven't finalized the trip yet. No, I haven't booked my, uh, I know the dates and I will email you and Jeff, I know you've emailed me. I'll get to it, sorry. Yeah, variolation was done long before Jenner, yes. It was done much longer in China, for example, both variolation and inhalation. That's absolutely right. So he was probably just picking up what he had heard, right? So this is obviously a two, two lectures on immune responses in a virology course. So if you want to learn more about immunology, you should take a virology, immunology course. That's not my point here, but I want to give you enough to understand how vaccines works, and how we develop disease that have immune components. That's the point here, not to give you uh, all of immunology. And I think what we have is enough for the, that purposes. Um, where can we find out details of the trip? Why don't you just send me an email, vincent at microbe.tv, and I'll send the, all of you who are out there um, some details, and maybe we can have a meetup. That's right. B cells are like DCs. They pick up antigens themselves, then travel to lymph nodes where they get activated by T cells. Thank you very much, Noor. That's exactly right. What would be a passing grade for your exam? Uh, you know, all the the... the Grades are curved, right? So the standard, it would be 
So what's passing? A D? No, I would say a C would be 70 or up, right? But if people did poorly, it could be 60 or up. Uh, I never fail anyone unless they don't take exams and quizzes. Everyone gets a grade for effort. So I'm a softy. All right, folks. I'll let you go now. That'll do it for another session. Come back Wednesday for Adaptive Immunity. Thanks, everyone, for coming here. Thank you, Mods, for handling the uh, onslaught. And I hope you all go away <laughs> knowing a little bit more about uh, viruses from today. Thanks a lot. See you next time.